The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals participating in the show. All persons described or mentioned in the podcast should be considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. This podcast contains subject matter such as violence and graphic descriptions along with adult language, which may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. On January 5th, 1935, a man is found beaten and stabbed inside the President Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. Who he is, how he died, and all the circumstances surrounding him makes one of the biggest mysteries in Kansas City history. You're listening to the Mysterious Bruise Podcast, and tonight we bring you the case of Room 1046. Welcome to a deep, dark, dank, moist basement somewhere in the bowels of soggy Georgia. Mm -hmm. We got a hell of a lot of rain in a short period of time. I didn't even notice. I was busy, I guess. Yeah, uh, our friends up around Nashville got one of them air tornadoes. Said six people lost, lost their lives. Up around Nishville. It went north of Nishville instead of downtown this time. Yeah. So there was some storms being produced last night. It took forever for it to get from Nashville to here. And then, like most times, the old weather apps totally screwed the pooch on when it was supposed to push through. Because everything we looked at last night and this morning was like, oh, it'll be out here by lunch. It was like 530 when we finally got where it was stopped raining. This damn cat, man. I'm going to kill it. This kitty will not stop trying to show me its butthole. Uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> Lord. Here we go. I don't want to see your butthole, kitty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good God, man. Okay, so I finally did find where we did have some new patrons, and we've got some returning patrons um we had some people that had to dip out because of financial reasons and we understand that we know that you give us your hard-earned cash so when you come back we're making just as much fanfare and that is miss natalie walker is back with us oh man that's awesome she's awesome yes i like her and then we had she is good people we also had why did it hit twice what it hit twice that she was a new patron, but anyway, we also had an upgrade. One of our upgrades, and I cannot. It's Miss Wofford, I believe. I'm saying her name's right. She's from Arkansas. I know that's a shorker. We also had Mister Mark O'Hare joining at the three dollar tier, and I'm going to screw this up, but this is a cross the pond. No, I'm not actually. He has a good. English name, Mr. James Bowley. He is a new, I don't know what that equates to. I am thinking that's a $3 tier. We're just going to go with that. That's what we're going to say. And our little question that we posed at the end of Dyatlov was very uh, well received. We had eight comments on the old Patreon. Nice. Miss Clifton said, could the crushing injuries have failed to leave bruising due to the intense cold outside? That's a great question. She also gave yeah, us a we possibly answer because we're dumb. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, she also gave us a well-known mystery in the Atlanta area, the Mary Shotwell case around Lennox Squire. I don't know that one. Oh, you would. It was that? on... Uh, Unsolved Mysteries, as soon as you see the clip, you'd be like, yep, yep, I remember that. I guarantee you right now you could text your sister and she'd tell you season and episode number. But anyway. What was her name? Mary Shotwell. I'm doing it right now. Mary Shotwell Little. So the other one was Mr. O'Hare 
said that that was a very good idea about the bruising, that the cold could have done that. Uh, he also stated that he thinks the Russians just want it to go away, and that's why they came out with that saying that it was solved. Imagine that. They want something to disappear. And then, of course, Miss Bliss commented and said, I am so glad you got your package. And she's going to add next extra beer next year. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, we got a package from our good buddy, Lumi Joe. That is right. They, got, those bottles are cool as crap. Uh, I can attest that what is inside those bottles is quite tasty as well. Uh, I am trying to not drink your bottle, but no promises. But it's pretty I'll good. Hit. Weird weird thing that happened, though. It's like I got a package. Lumi Joe said packages come. I said, all right. Okay. Go outside, there's a package. I said, hell yeah. All right. Go in and open it, and it's two Texas A&M sweatshirts, two koozies, and a shot glass. And I was like, okay. He sent me the wrong shit. <laughs> like, so I texted him, and I said, hey, man, you sent, you, you sent the wrong shit. He's like, this is not liquor. And I am not a Texas A&M fan. He's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> it says your package is out for delivery. And I was like. So, turns out, I got a package from Wallachachi, Texas, going to Canali, Alaska, and somehow it ended up in Dalton, Georgia. I know, and we, he, Coach sent me screenshots of the, he did his due diligence and tracked down the people on Facebook, and the lady, when he told her, he's like, I think I have your package. She's like, oh, that's cool. Do you live near Kenai? And he was like, well, no, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, we're in the same hemisphere. <laughs> We're, we're, we're in the same country, the according to Bible. Yeah, we're both above the equator. <laughs> but no, I'll be sending that to him. But yeah, uh, they gave. I guess they printed off Lumi Joe's packing slip twice, and just slapped it onto that package too. Oh, that is hilarious! <laughs> I mean, I I was dying laughing. While this is all going down, I'm telling my wife about it, and we are crying. I mean, I'm reading the text me- or the Facebook <laughs> messages to her, and it was it was. Joyful, joyful, I tell you. Brings me great joy. My Christmas present to those two strangers, I'm going to pay for that shipping. And that's what we do. (laughs) We just pay it forward. Sister never heard of her. That's right. But, hey, Uh, she's a... My sister says she never heard of Mary Shotwell Little. What? Yeah. Uh, You may have her. This may be the day that you get her. If you can't find it during the episode, because I know that you're about to Google it, what it, what season, what episode was it from Mysterious Brews or B- Mysterious Brews, Unsolved Mysteries? Yeah. Maybe one day they'll talk about us like that. <laughs> but anyway, you can let me know. Just interrupt way. Now, this case we're doing tonight, ladies and gents, I had heard of it, but I didn't. I was like, yeah. And so I got to sinking me old teeth into it. And it's quite the mystery. And I'm not so sure that the name at the end really is who they say he is. But they we think that's who it is. But yeah. you never know. No. I mean, we what, have identified him, but what happened and who did it, still a mystery. And of course, why it happened is a mystery. It's, but I do like, I do like the fact that they figured out who he was through the fact that he was a wrestler. I like that. It makes me happy. Well, I think also his his cauliflower ear. Hit, yep, them them them, them, them <laughs> cauliflower ears. Those are warnings to uh, jerk offs. If you see mm-hmm. one, you better steer clear. If you see a man with two cauliflower ears, he will wrap you in knots. Dude, let me tell you, that is one hundred percent true. Everybody that I train jujitsu with that I know has cauliflower ear are typically people that I wouldn't fuck with. There is one black belt. I know you know him. Uh, J-Rob. His freaking ears look like car doors open because yes, they he does do. so bad cauliflower, and he will he will tie you in a knot. Yes, yes, he will. He will literally tie you up by your, you know, your joints and bones, and you will not be able to move. And you will appreciate it and say, thank you, sir. Will you come back next yes. week and do this to me? Yeah, please, sir. Don't do that again, but I appreciate you very dearly. <laughs> Quit fucking around and give me the phone. <laughs> Is that from that Christmas gas thing you sent me? That shit was hilarious. 
No, oh my movie. God, that was hilarious. That and I was. I put the, I put I put the Christmas, Christmas gas in my car. Jeez. You fucking diesel! You fucking put diesel! <laughs> For fuck's sake, I raised you better than this. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. For fuck's sake. Uh, okay. Enough of our shitty accents. Now, on <laughs> to the mystery of room 1046, Governor. On the afternoon of January 2nd, 1935, a man who stated his name was one Roland T. Owen walked into the hotel president in Kansas City, Missouri. He was by himself, and the hotel staff would later state that he was, quote, well-dressed with a dark overcoat. The odd thing was he had no bags with him. They assumed that he was in his mid-20s, and he had a noticeable scar on his temple along with a cauliflower ear. They assumed he might have been an amateur boxer or wrestler, He requested an interior room several floors up and was assigned room 1046. Mr. Owen paid for a one-night stay and while riding up in the elevator with one Randolph Propes, the bellhop, Mr. Owen mentioned that he had stayed the previous night at the nearby Mulebach Hotel but found the $5 per night rate, quote, too high for his liking. Five dollars? Yes, sir. That was, what, 1935? Yes, sir. It's a nice hotel. This case is the only case that I have actually gone to the location, and I saw the room. I asked the lady behind the counter if it would be okay if I just went up there and looked. She's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I was like, room 1046. And she goes, we don't have a room 1046. And I was like, ma'am, I assure you, you do. (laughs) And she had no clue. So I educated her on the case and she was like, really? And I was like, yeah, this hotel is one of the biggest mysteries in the history of Kansas city. And she had no clue, but now the room is unused. It's just a door. Like it's not a, you can't go, you you can't stay there. You can't do anything, but they have preserved it. And it is, it's just a door. Well, there you go. A little history yeah. mystery for you. Yeah, yeah. So Mr. Propes escorted Mr. Owen to his room and opened the door for him. Since Mr. Owen had requested an interior room, the windows faced out into the courtyard of the hotel rather than out to the street. Propes would observe Mr. Owen remove a hairbrush, a comb, a tooth, some toothpaste from in the pocket of his overcoat, and this would be all of his personal items that were unpacked. After Mr. Owen placed the items carefully in the bathroom above the sink, he and the bellhop, Mr. Propes, both left the room. Propes would lock the door behind him, giving Mr. Owen the key. Propes would return to his post at the lobby and then observe Mr. Owen leave the hotel a short time later. One of the hotel maids, Miss Mary Soapdick, would begin her afternoon shift and went on to check on the new occupant of room 1046. She was startled to find Mr. Owen in the room because the previous night a woman had been staying in that room. She was stunned, but he said she could clean the room anyway. As she entered the room, she noted Mr. Owen's odd behavior. He had the shades completely drawn and only a single dim lamp on. This would be a recurring theme every time she would come to clean the room during Mr. Owen's stay. Additionally, He had a preference to seemingly sit in near total darkness. Ms. Soapdick would mention to police later that, quote, he was either worried about something or afraid, end quote. After she had been cleaning the room for a few minutes, Mr. Owen stood up, brushed his hair, put on his overcoat, and left the room. Before leaving, though, he asked her to leave the room unlocked when she was done since he was expecting some friends to visit. In just a couple of minutes, Ms. Soapdick was finished cleaning the room and complied with Mr. Owen's request. Around 4 p.m., she returned to the room with clean towels. Upon entering the room, she saw Mr. Owens lying on the bed on top of the covers, fully dressed in total darkness. On a bedside table that was illuminated by the light from the hallway was a note that read, quote, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. End quote. So Ms. Sobdick would state that it seemed more than strange 
but she simply changed the towels and left. The next morning, around 10.30 a.m., she returns to room 1046. This time, the door was locked. She took that as a sign that Mr. Owen was out since the room could only be locked from the outside after someone left. With fresh towels in hand, she opened the door with her master key and was immediately startled to find Mr. Owen inside the room, still on the bed in the same position as he had been the previous afternoon. The phone inside the room rang and Mr. Owen got up and answered it. Ms. Soapdick recalled the conversation with whomever was on the other end was brief and she heard Mr. Owen say, quote, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. I just had breakfast. No, I am not hungry. End quote. Remember, the note that Ms. Soapdick saw the day before was addressed to a Don. Now, during the conversation with this Don, Mr. Owen Paul, still holding the phone, and asked Ms. Soapdick about her job. As she is cleaning, Mr. Owens asked if she was responsible for cleaning the entire floor and if the hotel was a residential one. He then repeated his complaint about the neighboring hotel, Mule Box, high prices. After Ms. Soapdick finished cleaning, she left the room. During this time period, no one claimed to have seen Mr. Owen come or go from his room at all, nor did anyone report any visitors checking in to see him. Again, around 4 p.m., Ms. Soapdick returned with fresh towels for the room. This time, she heard two male voices talking back and forth, so she knocked on the door. A deeper voice than Mr. Owens's responded by asking who was at the door. Ms. Soapdick would respond that she was there to bring fresh towels to the room. The same deep, stern male voice replied, quote, we don't need any, end quote. Ms. Soapdeck knew there was no clean towels in the room as she had taken all of them when she cleaned the room earlier. She obliged the deep voice man and left without entering the room. Two hours later, around 6 p.m., one Gene Owen, no relation to Mr. Owen, decided not to drive back to Lee's Summit, which is located near Kansas City, after a long day of shopping in the city. She had become ill during her shopping and decided not to drive back home. She opted for a room at the President and checked into room 1048. Her boyfriend, who worked in a florist shop in the city, stopped by for a visit around 9.20 p.m. and stayed for approximately two hours. Later that night, she would tell police she heard men and women talking loudly and profanely all over the floor. Keep in mind, it's 1935, and most ladies don't speak that way. No, no, no proper lady would talk in such a manner. No, but little themselves. How dare you make such assumptions? <laughs> <laughs> now, this young lady was not the only one who noticed strange late night commotions. The elevator operator, one Charles Blocker, stated his or started his shift at midnight. He said he was fairly busy ferrying guests up until about 1.30 a.m. After that time, the hotel seemed to settle down for the evening, except for a loud party that continued in room 1055. Now, this could have been the source of the loud talking and the profanity that one Gene Owen heard. Mr. Blocker did state that one visitor to the floor in particular was a woman he had seen at the hotel before making visits to male guests. It was theorized she was a Lady of the Night. Other staff who had seen her also come and go came to the same conclusion that she was a Lady of the Night. So this Lady of the Night came in sometime during the first three hours of Mr. Blocker's shift and he took her to the 10th floor where she asked about room 1026. Just five minutes after dropping her off the elevator, Mr. Blocker was called back to the 10th floor where he found the same woman who looked perplexed. She explained that her client was not in room 1046. She went on to state that he had called her on a previous and on previous visits. He had always been there waiting. She then wondered aloud, if her client was actually in room 1024. So right now we're in a conundrum. She says when he first takes her up the elevator, she's going to room 1026. She calls the elevator back. Mr. Blocker's in the elevator. And she says that he's not, there's not a person in 1046. 
Then she wonders, well, maybe he was really in room 1024. So very odd behavior by the woman in the uh, hallway late in the evening. Now, she wondered aloud about room 1024 because they theorized that she could see through the window pane of the room that, uh, that a light was on. She did not ride the elevator back down at the time and remained on the floor after the conversation with Mr. Blocker, perhaps in a second-ditch effort to locate the regular client who had called her. Approximately an hour and a half later, or I'm sorry, a half hour later, Mr. Blocker got the signal that someone was calling the elevator back to the 10th floor. When he arrived, he found the same woman was waiting again. This time, she rode the elevator down to the lobby. An hour later, he would take her and a different male client to the ninth floor. At 4.15 a.m., a call came for the elevator to the ninth floor. Once again, it was the same lady of the night, and this time, she left the hotel for the evening. Another call to the ninth floor about 15 minutes later turned out to be the man who had accompanied this young lady. He explained to Mr. Blocker he couldn't sleep and was going out for a walk. The question is, why had she first been searching for a room 1026, only to mention 1046? Had Mr. Owen called her to the hotel, or was it truly another man entirely? Did she get the room number wrong, or had whoever called inadvertently given her the room number in error? Either way, Mr. Blocker gave a description of both the man and the woman he had seen several times that evening. He described the male as around five foot six, slender build, around 135 pounds, wearing a light brown overcoat, brown hat, and brown shoes. The woman was around the same height and weight with black hair, wearing a coat of, quote, black Hudson seal or imitation Hudson seal, end quote. No clue what that is. I did not look it up either, but I'm thinking it is a short fur coat. Like sh short hair fur coat. Yeah. Yeah. Fancy. The coat had a collar lined with a light fur strip and the collar stood up while Mr. Booker, or I'm sorry, Blocker was able to provide descriptions of these guests. He did not report seeing Mr. Owen or any other mysterious male coming down from the 10th floor during his shift that night. Now this all occurred on January 3rd, which would be the last day that anyone would see one Roland T. Owen alive. Early in the morning of January 4th at approximately 7 a.m., a new switchboard operator, Della Ferguson, arrived at work. She was in the process of making a requested wake-up call to room 1046 when she noticed a light on her board indicating that the phone inside the room was off the hook. Now, no wake-up call can be made if the phone's off the hook, so a bellman would have to be sent to the room in order to get the guest to place the receiver back on the hook. That bellman happened to be Randolph Propes, the same man that had shown Mr. Owen to his room. Propes arrived to find the door to room 1046 locked and a Do Not Disturb sign hanging from the handle. After several mm -hmm. loud knocks, a voice from inside told him to come in. There was a slight problem with that. The door was still locked from the outside, and he did not have a key. The voice from inside the room told Propes, after another knock, to, quote, turn on the lights, end quote, but no one came to the door to let him inside. Mr. Propes shouted through the locked door to, quote, put the phone back on the hook, end quote, and left. He then told Della Ferguson that the guest inside 1046 was probably drunk and to try again in an hour. So around 8.30, the phone had still not been hung up. This time, a different bellboy, Harold Pike, was sent up to room 1046 in a second attempt to resolve this phone situation. The do not disturb sign was still on the door and the door was still locked. But being smaller than the average bow, one Mr. Pike came armed with a key and he let himself in the room. Inside the room, still... With no lights on, he found a male figure lying on the bed prone and naked, naked, I say, and apparently passed out drunk. The light from the hallway revealed some, quote, dark stains on the bedding, but rather than turn the room light on and possibly wake the apparently sleeping man, Mr. Pike simply went to the bedside table where he found the phone had been knocked to the floor 
He picked it up, put the receiver back on the hook, and placed the phone back on the table and left. Around 10.30 a.m., another operator reported that the phone in room 1046 was once again off the hook. Propes was sent back to the room where he found the Do Not Disturb sign still on the door where it had been before. After several loud knocks went unanswered, he used a key to let himself into the room. Unknowingly, Mr. Propes had just stumbled into what he could only describe as, quote, a scene directly out of a horror film, end quote. When he opened the door, he found Mr. Owen on his knees and elbows with his head cradled in his hand, just two feet from the door to the room. That's no good. No bueno. No bueno. He, uh, he went through some shit, man. Yes. His head was bloody and had been bashed in. Propes turned the light on, placed the phone back on the hook, and it was at that moment he noticed blood splattered all over the room. Yeah, he did. He met a violent end. Let's just put it that way. It was on the bed, the walls, even the ceiling. There were traces of blood in the bathroom as if an attack had occurred in there as well. Propes immediately went downstairs to help or to get help and returned with the assistant manager. This time, though, they were only able to open the door about six inches because Mr. Owen had collapsed to the floor in the path of the opening door. That is correct. Somehow, during this bloody attack, Mr. Owen was still alive. Wow. He eventually got up off the floor, allowing Propes and the assistant manager to gain entrance into the room. As they got inside the room, Mr. Owen got up, went, and sat on the edge of the bathtub. The manager called the police, who in turn summoned a Dr. Harold Flanders from Kansas City General Hospital. Upon examination of the still conscious Mr. Owen, Dr. Flanders surmised that Mr. Owen had been bound with a cord or thin ligature around his neck, wrists, and ankles. There was extensive bruising around his throat, which suggested that there had been a strangulation attempt. He had also been stabbed more than once in the chest above his heart. One of these wounds led to a punctured lung. Vicious blows to his head left him with a skull fracture on the right side. Dr. Flanders cut the cords from Mr. Owen's wrist and asked him who had done this to him, to which Mr. Owen eerily replied, quote, nobody, end quote. He tried to maintain that the source of his injuries had been a simple fall in the bathtub causing him to hit his head. He did not even attempt to explain how he had come to be bound, stabbed, or strangled. The, the doctor asked him if he had attempted suicide. Mr. Owen said, quote, no. Then probably, probably, promptly <laughs> lost consciousness and was taken to the hospital. Sadly, Mr. Owen slipped into a coma while in transport to said hospital and never regained consciousness, passing away shortly after midnight on January the 5th, 1935. An autopsy of Roland T. Owen determined that he had died as a result of his wounds during an extremely savage beating and assault by an unknown assailant. Dr. Flanders not only examined the body, but the blood stains left behind in the room. Since much of the blood was already dried by the time he arrived, he determined that the wounds to Mr. Owen that caused the carnage inside the room occurred between 4 and 5 p.m. that day. You'd think somebody would have heard something. And that's what I mean, I'm wondering. Like, 4 or 5 p.m., are you going to beat a man to death and nobody's going to hear it? Well, and that's what I'm wondering. I didn't see what day of the week, January 5th, happened to fall on in 1935, but it could be that people that were staying at the hotel were out shopping in Kansas City and were, they just there was no one around to hear it. Also, they did construct things a little bit better back then, and you would uh, not hear quite as much ruckus as you do now when you stay at the Holiday Inn Express. Now, this time 
period is consistent with what Harold Pike had seen on his visit to the room. It also coincides with Mr. Prope's first visit where he was unable to enter the room, but a voice had summoned him to come in. This leads us to an obvious and scary conclusion, if you think about it, which is it was entirely likely that the person who had beaten Mr. Owen to a pulp was still in the room hiding when the unsuspecting Mr. Pike entered to place the phone back on the hook. The assault on Mr. Owen would have continued when Pike closed the door. That'll give you the old shit shivers. Now, detectives that searched room 1046 would make note more of what they did not find in the room as much as they, or as much as what they did find. Consistent with what had been witnessed on his check-in, no clothes were found in the closets or drawers. There was no luggage found in the room, and the only trace of clothing other than the one outfit Mr. Owen had been wearing was the tag from a necktie. Missing from the room was the soap, shampoo, towels, that were all provided by the hotel. No knives were found in the room, which seemed to immediately discount any notion of a suicide attempt since he had been stabbed twice in the chest. The cords that had bound him also indicated the presence of more than one person. One of the room's two glasses was found in the sink, broken and a missing piece that has not been found to this day. The other was on a shelf. Detectives also found other items that could have been evidence. A hairpin, a safety pin, an unsmoked cigarette, and an oddly full bottle of diluted sulfuric acid. Four fingerprints small enough that they were thought to be from a female were found on the phone. They could not be matched to Mr. Owen nor to any of the staff who had been known to have entered or been in the room during Mr. Owen's stay. Authorities were bewildered and reached out for help from the public via the press. Both of the city's newspapers carried the story in large headlines on their front pages the next day. One detective, Johnson, confirmed that the case was being classified as a homicide, claiming that, quote, there is no doubt that someone else is mixed up in this, end quote. Authorities hoped that the public might be able to assist them with any witnesses or potential leads. But the story was still far from solved, and there was a new bombshell that detectives discovered. That is, there was no such person as Roland T. Owen. Detectives quickly discovered that Roland T. Owen must have been an alias due to the fact that when they tried to notify the next of kin in Los Angeles where Mr. Owen had claimed to be from, they were told that authorities there, the LAPD, could not locate a record of anyone living under that name there at that time. Hmm. So he gave a fake name? Is that what you're saying? That's what they're saying. That is exactly what they're saying. The fingerprints were sent to the Justice Department's Investigation Bureau, which was the precursor of the FBI. And if you don't know what the FBI is, that's the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If you don't know who the FBI is. You don't know who's in the van across from my house. (laughs) Start Googling weird shit and you'll get to know them pretty well. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the evening that the news broke, a woman called the hotel president and asked what the man who was being called Roland T. Owen looked like. After receiving a description, she purported that he did not live in L.A. Well, no shit, lady. They figured that out. But instead, he lived in one Clinton, Missouri. Now, Clinton is located roughly 50 miles southeast of Kansas City. The mystery woman, however, never offered her name or the real name of Mr. Owen. On Sunday, January the 6th, the newspapers reported that the mysterious man in room 1046 had died under an assumed name and tips started pouring in. Members of the public attended the viewing of Mr. Owen's body. This led investigators to a cab driver named Robert Lane who claimed that he had seen Mr. Owen outside the hotel late on the evening of January 3rd looking, quote, disheveled and distressed. The cab driver went on to tell police of the encounter after seeing Mr. Owen's body, swearing that this was the man who held him down. 
like hailed a cab, not held. Purposefully holding. <laughs> Detective Johnson was not convinced due to the fact that none of the hotel staff had reported seeing Mr. Owen leave or return on the night of January 3rd or into the 4th. Police were able to establish, though, at least one sighting of Mr. Owen outside of the hotel. This was a report that he had been seen with two women at several liquor places on 12th Street. Newswire services got a hold of the story and ran with it. Within a matter of hours, the story was running in papers and on radio shows across the country. More Leads would flood in, and the Kansas City Police Department had to devote, quote, a considerable amount of time speaking with police from all over the country following up on these leads. Most of them were dead ends and were eliminated. However, an early lead that seemed promising turned out to be false when someone reported a bloody towel was found at the hotel. And it was Mr. Owen's blood. And that's because after police had left with his body, the hotel staff had cleaned up the mess and somehow that ho that towel was not thrown away. Now, investigators remembered that when they interviewed Mr. Propes, one of the bellhops, that he had told them that during the ride on the elevator to the room 1046, Mr. Owen told him he had stayed at the Mulebach Hotel the night before but no record was found of a Roland T. Owen checking in at the Muehlbach. Instead, the Muehlbach staff recalled that a man matching Mr. Owen's description had checked in under the name Eugene K. Scott, who also gave Los Angeles as his address. And just like Mr. Owen at the president, Eugene K. Scott also requested an interior room. Just like before, when, peace, when police go to follow up with the LAPD, on the name Eugene K. Scott, the LAPD come back and said they ain't one of them there. Which means there was not a person found by that name in the city at that time. Clearly, another alias had been given at the Muehlbach. Nothing else was gleaned from this tip. I mean, why, why is this guy trying to hide his identity so much? Secret Asian man. I'm not on the hell. <laughs> what I'm thinking. I mean, there's got to be a reason for it. I mean, we don't have an answer, but no, uh, there is. Yeah. Well, when we get into theories, there's trying, one. He's definitely trying to hide himself. He's trying to come and go and not let anyone know he's in the area. But the question is, why? What's he all afraid of? And who's this guy he's talking on the phone with? Who's this caller? Well, I mean, Clearly, he's got a reason to be afraid. I mean, the man was beaten to death. <laughs> that is true. Very, very good point there, Coach. Very good point. So a week into the investigation, a wrestling promoter named, and this has to be one of the best all-time wrestling promoters, Tony Bernardi from Little Rock, Arkansas, claimed that after viewing the body, the dead man, Mr. Owen, had approached him identifying himself as Cecil Werner, and in the beginning of December of 1934, this Mr. Werner had inquired about some potential wrestling matches in the area. Mr. Bernardi didn't have anything for Mr. Werner, but he did refer to another promoter in Omaha, Nebraska. This promoter was contacted, but he failed to recognize Mr. Owen. As time passed and the days went on, two new murders in the cities, cities, <laughs> like there's multiple Kansas cities, there is. I know it. To see what I did there is a play on words that actually worked. Yes. Have you ever been to Kansas City, Kansas? No, but I heard you didn't miss much. You always go to Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri is about, I don't know, 50% larger than Chattanooga. It's not a huge city, but it's a city. Kansas City, Kansas is, I don't even think there's a red light. <laughs> Like when I was married, my wife and I went and we stood in the middle of Main Street, Kansas City, Kansas at 5 p.m. And there were no cars. The fucking police department had closed for the night. What fucking police department closes? They were closed. We just let the stadies get it. The, it was insane. 
the difference. I was like, why are they even named the same? I, yeah. Like, Crazy. Because I always, you know, growing up, I was like, well. Kansas City must they, be in Kansas. <laughs> do the Chiefs play in Kansas City, Kansas, or do they play in Kansas City, Missouri? I assure you, there is nothing goes on in Kansas City, fucking Kansas. There is definitely not a pro team in Kansas City, Kansas. It is insane. So let me try this again. So he's got two new murders in the Kansas City, Missouri area. And this would draw detectives' attention away from the case. Leads were still followed up on, but with less fervor than they had previously. None of these new leads generated any significant information, and the case quickly started to go cold. The case returned to the papers on March 3rd when the funeral home where the body had been kept announced that it would be burying the still unidentified man in a potter's field next, the next day. That day, the funeral home would receive a call from a mysterious man who asked that the funeral be delayed so he could send the funeral home money for a proper burial and service at Memorial Park Cemetery in Kansas City. The man went on to elaborate this was needed in order for the dead man to, quote, be near his sister, end quote. Oh, wow. So the funeral director warned the caller that he would need to report this call and the information in it to the police as it was still an active investigation. The caller said that he knew this and it didn't bother him. The funeral director confronted the caller to test whether this was a prank and asked why Mr. Owen had been killed in the first place. To the funeral director's surprise, the man on the other end flatly stated that Mr. Owen had an affair with one woman while engaged to another. That'll do it. To this day, almost 100 years later, that'll still get your ass killed. It's not smart. No, not smart. Son. No, 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 no. So the mystery man goes on to tell the director that he and the two, quote, wronged women had arranged the meeting with Mr. Owen at the president in order to exact revenge. He would end the call with, quote, cheaters usually get what's coming to them, end quote. The service was, in fact, postponed at the anonymous caller's request. On March 23rd, a full 20 days later, the funeral home received a letter with the address carefully emblazoned with eerily precision. Now, the reason I put it that way is because everything that I read said that it looked like this was not your typical handwritten letter that of the day. That this looked like someone had literally taken a ruler out and printed the address to the funeral home. Inside this envelope was $25 wrapped in newspaper. That is approximately 500 schmackets in today's money. The money was more than enough to cover the funeral expenses, but there was no return address on the envelope, so the sender remained unknown. Two more envelopes containing $5 each were sent to a local florist for an arrangement of 13 American Beauty roses to be sent to the grave. The money followed after mysterious calls had been placed much like the one to the funeral home. The calls were made from different payphones and the caller never identified themselves. All of the envelopes not only contained money, but a card with what detectives named, quote, disguised handwriting reading, quote, love forever, Louise. The funeral was held shortly after March 23rd. Other than the minister, the only attendees to the funeral were police detectives, some of which were pallbearers. Other detectives posed as grave diggers and staked out the grave for several days to see if any suspects or possibly... Perhaps the mysterious benefactor would appear to pay their respects, but no one ever showed up. Several days after the funeral of a this Mr. Owen, a woman called the Kansas City Journal's newsroom, or I'm sorry, the Kansas City Journal Post's newsroom, to inform them 
that their earlier story about the dead man from room 1046 being buried in a potter's grave was incorrect and that he had, in fact, been given a proper burial. She then said that both the funeral home and the florist could confirm this. When asked to identify herself, the woman hesitated and said, quote, never mind, I know what I'm talking about, end quote. They pressed her for further details, and she inexplicably ended the call with, quote, he got into a jam, end quote, and hung up. I mean, I'll say a jam. No, he got the hell beat out of him. You get beaten to death. That's not a jam. No, no, no. A jam is, hey, baby, I need some bail money. Yeah. <laughs> he was definitely into something serious because shit. Yeah. So the story continued to make its rounds in the press, but some people seemed to uh, just be done with the old mystery. Mr. Owen's picture was circulated nationwide in a vain attempt to identify him, but there was no one that came forward with his true identity. This mystery of room 1046 would have fizzled out if it were not for the disappearance of another person who would remain unidentified until about a year after the murder of Mr. Owen. A friend of Ruby Ogletree's in Birmingham, Alabama, showed her an issue of the American Weekly. You may be thinking to yourself, self, the hell's that American Weekly? Well, <laughs> the American Weekly is, or still it wo- or was, it still is, or it was, a Sunday newspaper supplement that just happened to feature an article about the case. Mr. Owen's photo strongly resembled Ruby's missing son, Artemis, whom the family had not seen since he left for California in 1934 via the hitchhiking thumb. Artemis had been in communication with his family via letters, but just in case Ruby reached out to the Kansas City Police Department, she was able to provide the officers with enough identifying information about Mr. Owen that included a description of the scar on his temple. She explained the scar was a result of a childhood accident involving hot grease. In November, another newspaper supplement carried a story that identified the previous anonymous corpse of Mr. Owen as none other than that of Artemis Ogletree. Now, you would think this would be case closed. I snuck one past coach, and we're dealing with a solved case. Not, not so fast. Not so fast. Nah, not so fast, my friend. No, no, no. That's not how we play around here. The mystery man of room 1046 refused to go away, just like he refused to die when they beat the hell out of him. And Ruby's account started raising more and more questions. Ruby had received letters allegedly from her son after he had died in Kansas City. The first arrived in early 1935, and it was postmarked from Chicago. The letter was neatly typed, which immediately raised Ruby's hackles. Since, according to her, as far as she knew, her son didn't know how to type. The language in the tone of the letter was also inconsistent with how Artemis spoke. In May 1935, another letter arrived, allegedly, from Artemis. And in this letter, Artemis claimed he was going to Europe. This letter was followed by a special delivery letter saying that his ship was leaving that day. Both letters were postmarked from New York City. In August, Miss Ruby would receive a phone call from Memphis, Tennessee. The caller claimed that Artemis had saved his life in a fight, but he could not call and speak to her because he was now living in, of all places, Cairo, Egypt, where he had married a wealthy woman and was doing well. I'd say. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's not every day. It's not every day a boy from Alabama gets to California, gets on a (laughs) ship, In New York City and sells to Cairo and marries a wealthy woman. I would say he made a name for the Ogletrees, if that's to believe. I would say so. I mean, old boy did good. He outkicked his coverage trace times. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the caller would go all in and claim that Artemis was also unable to write her because he had lost one of his thumbs in the same fight that saved the caller's life. I mean, it's a hell of a fight if you lose a thumb. 
Now, Ruby spoke with this man for approximately 30 minutes. She would state that the man on the call spoke, quote, wildly and irrationally, like he was on some kind of wackiness, but seemed to have firsthand knowledge of her son. She gave the police the name that the caller identified himself by, but this name has never been revealed to the public. If we believe the caller and Artemis had indeed left the country for Europe or Egypt, he more than likely didn't use his real name or he paid a hefty price to keep his name off of the manifest of the steamship companies because they were contacted and they never had any records of an Artemis Ogletree traveling with them. The consular section of the U.S. Embassy in Cairo also was unable to find any evidence that he had been there. Through conversations with Ruby, it was discovered that Artemis did turn up a... Th- not a third time, but he turned up at a third hotel in Kansas City. This time, it was the St. Regis. Allegedly, this is where Artemis had stayed and shared a room with another man. Whether or not this was the elusive Don mentioned in the notes and on the phone call by Artemis himself could never be proven. So in 1937, police arrest a man named Joseph Ogden on a murder charge after he killed a man he shared a room with and placed this man's body in a trunk to be shipped to Memphis. Among the several aliases he used was the name Donald Kelso. He had stayed in a Kansas City hotel in 1934 under this name, and his roommate at the time had been one Duncan Ogletree. Ding, 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 ding. According to a story about the case in the New Yorker, the Kansas City Police Department had matched samples of the man's handwriting to that of the handwriting in the letters that were sent to Ruby Ogletree after Artemis' death. Now, no charges were filed against Mr. Ogden in the Ogletree case due to the lack of solid evidence, but police kept the case open. The files showed that every few years, detectives would review the case all the way up through the 1950s, but no new evidence was ever uncovered. Eventually, the case went cold and it would fall out of the public eye until sometime around 2003-2004. That is when a local historian at the Kansas City Public Library named Dr. John Horner took a call from out of state from someone who said they'd been helping to inventory the belongings of an elderly person who had recently passed away. Among this elderly person's belongings was a shoebox filled with newspaper clippings about the Ogletree case, along with an item that had been mentioned in one of the articles. Now, the caller did not identify themselves or what the item in question was, but they emphasized that whatever this item is, it had been mentioned in the original news articles. This is where the case stands to this day. The absence of suspects or a conclusion has not prevented various theories about the murder of Artemis Ogletree's ultimate fate. So it, and there's not a, a lot of viable theories. I'm, there's a ton of bullshit ones on Reddit, but there's just a couple that I wanted to touch on. The first one was the anonymous caller theory. Remember, the anonymous caller sent money for the burial, stated he was doing it for his, Artemis's sister, and quote, cheaters usually get what's coming to them, end quote. This has led to a popular theory that Artemis was engaged to be married and cheated on his fiancee with another woman. This then caused his fiancé's brother or a friend to kill Artemis. The supposed statements made by the anonymous caller were first published in magazines and papers after his death, embellishing the story, possibly jumping off the actual fact of the mailed flowers and letter from Louise, but the caller never made those statements. Those specific statements were entirely made up in the newspapers. I know that's a shocker that they were making shit up in the 30s in the newspaper, but guess what? They did, and they still do it today. What? I know. Now, what we know as fact is as follows. One, we know that Artemis had been traveling through the country, staying at various hotels under different names at times with another possible person named Don. He traveled extremely light with no identification on him, carrying 
a brush, a comb, and some toothpaste. He had cauliflower ear, indicating he was a fighter or a boxer, and was confirmed to be looking for wrestling matches to sign up for under the name Cecil Werner. The investigation into his room found everything had been removed. Among the other few things found was a bottle of diluted sulfuric acid. That's going to come into play in a minute. And a woman's fingerprints. Now, a person or persons were willing to pay for his funeral and send flowers from someone named Louise. The flowers were sent twice due to an error when first being mailed, showing the importance of the sender. Someone with knowledge of Artemis's death or responsible for his death sent letters to his mother in an attempt to cover their tracks. So the next theory, and this is the one that I like the most, is uh, will be the last theory that we discuss because, like I said, it's the only one that makes a little bit of sense. And that is the theory that he was involved in organized crime or he was involved with criminals from organized crime. Which might come into play with the word Don. So the key thing in this theory that does not, or I'm sorry, that does hold the weight is that sulfuric acid that they found in room 1046. In the 30s and on into the 50s, it was common practice for the mob to either dissolve their victims' bodies in sulfuric acid or remove the victims' fingerprints with diluted sulfuric acid. If the sulfuric acid was there to help hide the identity of the victim, it doesn't sound like it would have been a crime of passion. Is it possible that the man, quote, named Don, what that Artemis was meeting with was an actual mafia boss referred to as a Don? How would Artemis have gotten mixed up with organized crime? Well, in the 1930s, organized crime became heavily involved in fixing boxing matches. Gangsters like Owen Madden, who owned speakeasies and nightclubs in New York City, were also boxing promoters who featured several high-profile fights. Organized crime's involvement only become more synonymous with professional boxing in the following decades. It's possible Artemis was employed by the mob as a fighter and at some point lost a lot of money. Louise was someone related to or close to the mob who he was involved with. And Don was Artemis's boss who worked for the mob and traveled with him, coming to know him personally. Knowing he had cost the mob money, Artemis would was worried and anxious about meeting with Don, as Mary Soapdick noted he appeared to be when she cleaned the room. Since they knew his real name and where his mother lived, he couldn't just run away and disappear, which would also explain why, when asked who attacked him, Artemis only replied with nobody. (laughs) Clearly, somebody did. Yeah. After Artemis was murdered, Don, or someone else working with the mob, sent letters to Artemis' mother to make her believe that her boy was still alive. Since Artemis worked for the mob, his funeral arrangements were taken care of anonymously by them. What you have to keep in mind is up until, hell, it may still be going on now, but I know up until they put the Teflon Don Gotti behind bars, that it was just an unspoken rule with the mafia. It didn't matter whether it was a girlfriend, a mistress, a sister, a mother, an aunt. You didn't touch the women. Okay. Exactly. You, you didn't, and you don't respect them. If you do, you will be severely punished and i think that kind of leads into those letters going to his mother they don't want to break her heart they want her to believe that her son is doing well when he had was basically beaten to death and say what you want to about the mob back in the 30s they had a little bit of honor so they took care of his funeral arrangements that's where i'm at on this one because the mob angle does seem to fit especially since we know they did fix a lot of boxing matches. He could have been a dumbass and was supposed to throw a match and decided, nope, I ain't throwing anymore. I ain't going to be somebody's punching bag. And that's how that cauliflower ear got there. <laughs> that I mean, that does make sense that they would definitely retaliate towards something like that. Well, and also it's a business with them. 
if you fuck up, you're going to pay with your life. But understand, we're not going to degrade your family and basically put them on blast as the youngins say now days. But we may never know who killed Artemis and short of a deathbed confession or discovery of a tell-all journal entry, the mystery man of room 1046 will likely remain unsolved. Oh, at this at this point, there's the deathbed confessions out of the question. Whoever killed him's gone too by now, surely. Well, you'd think so, but they still got the JFK shit classified. I don't see yeah, how anybody still. We're talking about 1935, though. Well, I understand that, but we're still talking about some chimney smoking some bitches <laughs> in the 60s. <laughs> 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 but anyway. So that is the case of the mystery man of room 1046. Now, I know Coach has recommended this in the past. My recommendation. Uh, all right, hold on. Before I get to my recommendation, look, as our good buddy Cody says, he, I'm not wearing an armadillo hat, but there might be a tinfoil hat underneath my hat. <laughs> And the reason I bring this up is because I've been listening to his recommend Cody's recommendation of the MLK tapes. And I'm like eyeballs deep into this now. And so they keep referencing this HBO mock trial that was done in either 93 or 99. I can't remember which. So I start Googling it. There's no record of it. It is on, there's only a paragraph about it on IMDb. I even got my brother-in-law today at lunch who has the Max app to search for it and there is nothing you cannot find a copy of it you can't find a copy of it on uh youtube copy of what now it's it was an hbo documentary it was a mock trial and it was called the trial of james earl ray or they said it could be under the name guilt or innocence the trial of james earl ray i've looked for every combination Short of going on the dark web, I can't find it. And I'm too much of a chicken shit to go on the dark web and look for it. They're they saying the James Earl Ray didn't do what they said he did. No, dude, by like episode two, you know, James Earl Ray did not do what he did or what they I'm, say that I'm, he did. I believe that the, if I'm not mistaken, the family themselves, ML, MLK's family doesn't believe that he did it. Oh, no, they won a civil trial in Memphis uh, in the 90s, I believe. And after they, I think Coretta spoke with James in prison, and she came away from the first time talking to him knowing that he didn't do it. Um, It's, man, it's odd. It is like some of the shit that has been uncovered by the guy that did this is just, it'll make you scratch your head. Now, I listened to the RFK tapes, and it was very now, well put together. If you go to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, which is the Lorraine Motel, where he was shot, you can, once you go through it, it's such an amazing fucking museum. It is insane how good they've done that museum. But you walk across the street, and you go to the, the little the building where the shot took place and you stand there and you look across it's not a hard shot to make no it's it not was, it's not a sniper shot like anybody that just knows anybody that's ever fired a rifle could make the shot could make that shot yeah that what i didn't i thought he was shot in the chest what i did not know was that they shot him in the face it took I off didn't know that either. the left side of his face Really? I thought it was the chest. I did too. Anyway, well, I'm not going to spoil it for. Could that, that be a Mandela effect? Well, it could be. Hell, that's and and that's what I, and that's why I kind of talk about this tinfoil hat conspiracy thing with this HBO documentary. I'll just leave it at this. Like Coach said, if you don't know who the FBI is, listen to our podcast long enough, and they'll be parked outside your damn house when you start googling <laughs> shit. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So my recommendation, and I know that Coach has recommended this in the past, but I'm going to recommend it. Blind Frog, Blind Frog, blah, blah. Blind Frog Ranch, man. I love him. I'd like to go buy them boys a beer, except for the sun. And just because 
not that he's a turd or nothing like that. The two old men, the head of security. Hold on. I don't have nothing about against this. I just want to sit down with the two old guys. No, no. You got to buy the son a beer too. I will buy him a beer. I just want to talk to the two old men to begin with. And then me and the son can go like drink beer somewhere else. I just want to talk to the two old men first. Here's what blew my mind. And you know, when you watch these quote reality shows, I was just watching the latest episode the other day. And it dawned on me that them dumb son of a bitches ain't staying on the property. And they just cannot believe that someone would have the balls to come over there and start digging where they were digging. And I'm thinking, well, you dumb asses, your ranch borders BLM land. All they got to do is wait for you to drive through the gate, wait about 30 minutes, have a lookout with a walkie talkie, and they know you're not coming back. It's not like Skinwalker where they got the whole damn thing fenced off and they've got more security than Fort Knox. But anyway, so my recommendation is Blind Frog Ranch. And if I have tickled your fancy about the MLK conspiracy, you can type in Film Rise did a one hour documentary that kind of gives you the Reader's Digest version about the conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King. And it's well put together. It's just 50 minutes. Doesn't, there's not a lot of meat on that bone. But I warn you, if you start traveling down this path you're gonna get way in the weeds be careful so that's my two recommendations coach what you got uh i'm gonna recommend a show that i've been re-watching on max uh i think it's a great show i'm very sad that it was i was very sad when it was canceled to begin with but re-watching it super sad that it was canceled it's gotham about you know yeah i forgot rising. about that yeah yeah you know bruce wayne's a kid He's not really Batman yet, and but you see the rise of all the villains. It's a very good show. I've been rewatching that nonstop. Quite the interesting recommendation, sir. Quite, quite. That's just what I got, man. That's just, that's just, that's just what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? He's just a simple man. man. He's just a simple man. He don't want no Texas A&M shirt. He just wants a fifth of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some barbecue sauce. I promise you ain't in the fifth no more. It's probably about a third. Atta boy. <laughs> well, ladies and gents. Fractions would be, in fraction wise, that would be more, but not in uh, a f- liquor. You're, wise. you're talking about there's a third left of the original fifth. There's a third of the fifth. There you go. I guess a 15th. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got any more math for our listeners today there, coach? Oh, you know I don't. Uh, deuces.